Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about illustrations. Um, I think, you know, I'm standing here, and partly thanks to Mark, because I got my job in, in Lampeter, courtesy of, of um, Mark's intervention at a time when I didn't have any work. So um, thank you, Mark, for that. Um, Aaron didn't mention my comments to um, participating in, in the, the layers project. And um, in response to, to Adam's question, I think what I'm going to talk about this afternoon really is, is that is the result of that because being a, a, a you know not a hard scientist by any stretch of the imagination but being someone in the quaternary I, I, um, I just do things and don't think about them very much normally um, and um, so participating in, in the layers project and doing some drawing and I'm not, 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 not very good at drawing you know as a, as a school child I, I was turned off that pretty quickly because I didn't conform to what the school teachers thought a, a picture should be, so I, I, you know, I dismissed that from my repertoire of skills very early on. Um, so, actually, having to do some illustrations as part of uh, of an offshoot of, of the layers project, and then realizing actually I do do quite a lot of drawing, um, as as you will see, and and I began to think about um, what it was I really did, and and this links to Francis's um, uh, talk yesterday in. Uh, in response to a piece of um, work that he's got up on display over on the other side, um, about how we use illustrations and, and, and their their role and, and, and how I use them. So this is purely personal. I'm not saying that all Paleolithic archaeologists do it this way. I'm not even actually talking about the Paleolithic all the time, so I'm, I'm going right into the Holocene, I'm afraid. Um, so, you know, I, I am diverging from, from, the, um, from the task a little bit. Um, some of this might be blindingly obvious to some of you, but it, it, it's taken me a long time to get here. Um, join the dots, um, hand X, and a face from the same set of dots. Um, <laughs> this sort of reminds me of somebody, and I can't think who it is. Um, I thought it was Donald Trump, actually. Um, and that was, you know, just, just chance. But, it's all about lines to me. I realised that. Thinking back, I was, I was trying to think about what I drew as a child. Um, for, for those who don't recognise what that is, it's a track layout plan for a model railway. And I used to draw them lots as a child. And I never had the money to actually turn it into a reality. Um, and it didn't really matter where it was going from and to. It was the lines, they had to link up and they had to, had to make sense. And, and I think, um, you know, that's what I've spent my, my entire rest of my career up to this point, hopefully for a few more years on, on, onwards, um, in, in doing that sort of thing. Sadly, my brother, he's, he's, who's also there, failed this task and he didn't in integrate with the line. So any of you who know him um, <laughs> might understand that his, his trajectory has gone off in a slightly different role to mine, although we work quite effectively, I think, together. Anyway, um, so lines, yes, I mean, the classic... Um, diagram here from the, from the London Tube, which we all know, it gets us from A to B. Um, it sort of upsets my sense of geography a little bit because it's not reality as I see it, uh, and that's more of the reality of, of the real tube map. And, and I think um, in the sorts of things that I do, I, I, I'm beginning to wonder how much reality there is to some of my diagrams, but I'll show you, hopefully, that whatever the fact or fiction of the diagrams, they can be used, they are used, and sometimes in the sort of work that Francis and I do, um, there's a lot riding on getting the diagrams right, whatever that means. Um, I was interested to listen to, 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 to Roger Penrose, because I, on the, on the life scientific, and he, he described a lot of my thinking as visual, and I thought, yeah, that is what I do. I actually realize that when I write, I do all the pictures first, the drawings first, and the words are almost sort of, um, incidental um, to that process, so I've got to get, I've got to get the, the story right in my brain before I, you know, through pictures before I can do do anything like that. And some of the work I do with Erin, where she's far more because of her discipline, picky about words, and we run into conflict <laughs> because my, I, I'm somewhat you know I, I do it through 
through this medium. And I expect everybody to understand these diagrams, which is probably a, uh, not a very good um, assumption. This was a statement I was at a meeting um, with Historic England and, and Kent County Council the other day, and, and the science advisor, when we were talking about developing an urban database for Dover, <coughs> Um, and me using my geoarchaeological knowledge to help them construct that urban database, at the end of the day said, we want lines on maps, which is what Francis was talking about yesterday. We want pictures and illustrations. The words seem to not matter. They don't want a great big load of information that describes things. They want it, it on um, pictures. So, and I think, you know, we do pictures of this kind quite well. Um, the sort of work that we do when we do talk about the Paleolithic um, is, is slightly different to the rest of, of um, archaeology. It's poorly understood by um, uh, most archaeologists. Uh, at the panel with the, uh, the meeting yesterday evening, somebody was talking about monkey studies and monkey men that I think David Peacock used to refer to uh, Clive's work as. That typifies what we're dealing with in the Paleolithic as, as a general sort of barrier that comes down 10,000 years ago and you go back into the past um, and uh, it, it's very different. We're talking about major time intervals, massive time intervals, tens of hundreds of thousands, millions of years um, and those have to fit into our, our, our diagrams so we have to, to integrate that. Um, we're talking about archaeology and geological context, we're not talking about normal sites um, so we have to think uh, very different. The, and, and vast changes in geography, and, and this presents a challenge to us. Um, you know, this is the sort of diagram that Francis and I are, are, are familiar with. Um, a whole series of simplified sections there, joined by lines, and then the important thing here, uh, yes, the geography is important in here, but it's the lines joining them up that allow us to see what's going on. We spend hours doing this sort of thing, and we, we often argue about, oh, that line should come here or here, you know, and, and um, so our diagrams change, um, and you know it depends whoever wins the argument, whether you're a lumper or a splitter. And Francis and I have this this debate. I like to lump everything together. He likes to split, um, and those diagrams will change and reflect that balance of the argument. Maps. You know this is a, this is a map um, from a paper by Cohen et al. in, in 2011. Um, this represents probably half a million years. This is a, a map for some, you know, the period between about a million years ago and half a million years ago. It's, it's helpful in many senses, because it shows a bit of a different geography, but it's not telling us anything about a particular point in time. Um, somebody took one of my maps like this this week, and I got an email from them saying, uh, oh, I've taken your map for the Sussex Coastal Plain where I've drawn sort of ancient cliff lines and ancient beaches on it. I went out to try and find them and I couldn't find them. <laughs> and I thought, oh, shit. Um, I didn't realise that people were actually using my map quite like that. And, and so that made me think, well, you know, they've taken it at a point in, in time when I've got to that stage in the narrative and they've pulled it out and they've used it for something completely different. And with my sort of logical, um, you know, one-way direction thinking. I hadn't realised that that might happen. So again, that's something I've got to factor in in the future. Um, so when we I'm just going to run through how I do these sorts of things and how I, my diagrams change through a, a whole set of processes. Um, image to process, image to process in a sort of circular um, fashion. Um, and as I move from one image to the next, hopefully more information is going to be um, collected into that, so there's no beginning and end in that sense. The other thing is we, we've got a spiral in terms of space and time, we, we can go into the centre, we can go drill down to very uh, high resolution, single events, or zoom out to big long time scales um, and um, large scale geographies, and, and we're trying to balance these sorts of um, different uh, working scales up, oh, if that makes sense. Um, and don't worry about the detail in here, you probably can't even read it from the back. Um, this is just showing that there are different stages in which I produce different illustrations depending on um, where we are um, in the process of thinking. 
Um, and I'm largely talking here from the perspective of developer-funded archaeology. This is a model that's um, developed for that because I work quite heavily in that. And they want a product at the end down here somewhere. Um, and it's how we think our way through that, um, that that's important. So we start off with a forward model. Usually this is a model we have in our head, a conceptualization of what might be out there, wherever we're going in the field, but it's really put down on paper. Um, I'm trying to put it down on paper more and more, because if you don't really think through what you think you're going to find out there when you start, then whatever you produce further down the line is not testable back against, uh, against that. So archaeologists, whether they're geophysicists or, or, or um, straightforward um, archaeologists, don't set out this baseline very often. Um, not, you know, not, not, not hard and rigorously. Uh, we then move to a basic framework of what's actually there in our, in our terms. So here's a, here's, a, here's a forward model. This thing here is um, downtown Dover, actually, um, and the, the shape of the landscape underneath Dover mm -hmm. that I produced in the 1990s. It's a very crude uh, model. Um, this is the sort of model for the Roman period in, in, in Dover, and it's based just on um, archaeological excavation data and some borehole data um, to produce a sort of model of shape of the landscape. Here's the Roman harbour coming in around here, and this is where the, the Roman fort is. That, that's a sort of example of a, of a forward uh, model. We then go and collect, sorry, that's so, um, so pale there. Um, that's a, uh, one of my drawings from 1982 or 1983, probably, in Boxgrove, um, just to show I can draw a little bit. Um, so we go out and collect data on the individual layers in the landscape, and we draw them. And that's what forms the basis of our all those diagrams that I, I, I was showing uh, back then. So we produce something like, like this, turns it, neaten it up, I'm drawing it by hand there. Um, I'll talk about the balance between digital ways of doing this and, 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 and hand drawing it um, in a minute. So we begin to see what the deposits are across space. This is already an interpretation of what's really out there. Um, people call this the primary, primary data. These are borehole logs, perhaps. And to a geotechnical person, who's constructing foundations for a building, this is the data they use. This is hard scientific data. We know, in fact, those boundaries are anything but hard and, and, and firm. Um, and, and already this is deviating from reality. Um, we can produce three-dimensional sections, and here's one. I, those are the books that are just lying on my floor. I'm not quite sure what they said by my state of um, mind there. It covered in coffee stains, but this is a sort of um, attempt to, to visualise actually the stratigraphy around the Dover Bronze Age boat, which we worked on a number of years ago. It turned into something uh, more like this nice, neat um, diagram showing the lithology changing over space. Um, we then turn that basic mythology into groups of context, if you like, stratigraphy. Here's Francis's very nice three-dimensional stratigraphy from the absolute elephant site. Um, and this is a fully three-dimensional model you can move around in, and, and all these dots of the archaeology and the faunal um, remains. Um, so that's that phase. We move then on into uh, modelling the probability of the structure beneath the ground surface. So, so this is um, Dover again, um, central Dover here, with um, using different sorts of information to create a model beneath the ground surface. But again, these are um, these are the sorts of things that English heritage or uh, historic England were asking for. Um, this is what they want. They want structures. They want lines on maps. They want these sorts of things, but we can change any of these, just changing the mathematical models we use to produce those. So, you know, well, I'm not quite sure um, 
you know, you pay your money, take your choice. <laughs> um, here's the sort of thing Francis was talking about yesterday. Lines on maps, they want these. They want these zones, different geoarchaeological zones, different archaeological zones, each one with its own unique characteristic, and we build them up from those sets of sorts of data that I've just been showing. Um, this is the synthesis of all of those, and these are zones around Chichester for the Paleolithic. These are hugely important um, for planning and development because they'll use these zones to base the response to uh, development. Um, these sorts of cartoons, again, this is back to Dover, showing the um, landscape evolution in a pictorial way, much easier than, than trying to explain it in, in lots of um, words. Handle computer. This is a, um, I started off doing everything by hand like this. There are um, computerized systems for putting borehole data and, and archaeological data in to a computer program that produces um, diagrams like this. But I've actually gone back to doing it by hand because that process of actually drawing um, is missing here. Um, it, 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 you can quite easily get the wrong the wrong um, answers from something like this. So I've gone back, I, I've turned my back on the digital age somewhat when I'm actually trying to do this uh, sort of work. Um, here's just two examples. These are the same sections uh, drawn by hand and produced by the, the software uh, modeling. You can see there's basic similarities, but um, clearly differences. Um, proof of the pudding of whether all of this works um, is actually, do we find anything? Um, well, that sort of approach and getting the lines in the right place got us in the right place to find the Dover boat. So I think that probably um, exemplifies that. I've got two more slides, I think. Um, <coughs> another example of where we've used this and where lines are really important are on the Channel Tunnel Rail Link, um, where the Thames, uh, this is the crossing um, box for the, on the south side of the River Thames, we had to find the archaeology there. This is the diagram that was produced. This is uh, different boreholes. Here's the Thames, here's the south side, here's the north side. Um, and we needed to model what, where the deposits of archaeological significance we thought uh, were in these areas here. And we superimposed that. There's the engineering. This is where destruction was going to take place. So we knew we had to do something in there. So we're marrying hard geotechnical data with the softer interpretation of our lithologies in order to say that's where you needed to dig in case there was going to be archaeology. Um, I won't go through that. And that's where we did, and we got the archaeology. Now, getting those lines in the right place in this instance was worth a lot of money. They had piling rigs, um, machines ready to go. If we hadn't picked this and spotted it, they'd have had piling rigs sat there doing nothing. So getting those lines in exactly the right place was really important. Um, so I think I'll, I'll just leave that there and uh, say thank you very much.